Thank you very much, Soups. Uh, I indeed work for the company Autonomous Intelligent Driving, and we're trying to build self-driving vehicles, and we use a lot of deep learning for that. And I was asked to give an overview on what deep learning is, and do this in 10 minutes, and don't use any math. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to uh, give it a try. One important thing to know about this whole deep learning field is that you very often hear new research papers and see big advancements, uh, which do use a lot of these interesting uh, neural networks. But I think you only need to know a little bit about how these work to be able to use it and start using it and start toying around. So I'm going to focus on these ones. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to know that this whole neural network thing is inspired by the brain. So in your brain, you see neurons, which are these big black dots, and they are connected to, tr to other neurons via spikes. And if one neuron receives a lot of input by spiking other neurons, and it gets activated enough, then it starts spiking itself, and it activates other neurons. So people were thinking, how can we put this into some kind of mathematical, programmatical uh, model? And the easiest way to start is say, let's say that we want to predict the price of a house. Well, yesterday we had to talk about that, but let's say that you, as input uh, factors, have the area of the house, the age of the house seems to be pretty important, as well as something like a distance to a train station. Then you have weights, which uh, influence the price of a house. And here, in this case, we can say that, let's say that this was our brain, we would have one neuron, which would become very active when the price of the house was high, and very lowly activated, or maybe even negative activated, if the price of the house was, would probably be low. So you have some kind of weight that influence, uh, that you multiply the area of the house with, and that influences the price of the house directly. But this is a very simple perceptual model, and often you have something more interesting, like if you have a house that is close to the train station and small, it sounds like a crappy house, but it's actually often an inner city apartment, and those are, uh, yeah, those are often very expensive. So you have combinations of inputs that are very important. So this is where you add a <coughs> hidden layer with neurons and the inputs to our neural network. These input neurons, they have activations that go to these combinations, this feature, and then these features go to uh, the outputs. And what you do is, if you have a certain predicted output for the price of the house, if that output is too high, then you say to all the weights that influenced that prediction that they should be a little bit lower. So this is the very easy explanation of gradient descent. And if the output is too low, then all the weights that didn't contribute a lot, they should be higher. So they should put, the, like, put more importance on the features that were constructed here. Now, if you, there's one important thing which I won't go really deep into, and that is on these hidden neurons, you should put an activation function. So in this case, you could say, if our output for our hidden feature is negative, we just keep it at zero, and like, just like in the brain, the neuron is not activated, and otherwise we keep it. So this is something called ReLU. Um, there's also a mathematical idea behind it, and I won't go deep into it, but this is, activation functions are important. Um, let's try to do something more interesting now. So now we can predict the price of a house and have features there. Let's try to predict some digits. So in this case, we have, of course, an activation per class. So we have 10 output neurons, one for each digit. And in this case, we want an output neuron to be very high when we observe that certain in, uh, digit, and low when we don't observe that certain digit. So then your output is 10 neurons, and they are highly activated if we see the digit. We could use our deep forward approach again and uh, just flatten the image so that you, instead of having a small image, have just a lot of input neurons where each neuron is one pixel. And you can, again, take combinations of these pixels. So let's say that um, there's a pixel in the middle active and a pixel at the top active. That's probably one feature that you might want to look for when you try to recognize a one. And again, if the like, a class is predicted too high, then you say, hey, these features that we predicted before, they should, the, the weights on those should be lower. And neural networks are able to figure out what is important <laughs> and what features to construct. This is also a pretty bad approach. 
So if you look, for example, at these three sexes, we, all, we can all agree that these are sexes, right? Um, but for a computer model, which ha just has this flattened input list of pixels, it has to learn the same features for every location that a six can be in the image. So that's kind of a terrible thing. And on my first day of school, we were trying to learn how to recognize characters as, as kids. You know, you have to try to learn how to read. And my teacher told me to search for straight lines and to search for arcs, because apparently those are important features for us humans when trying to see what kind of character something is. So in neural networks, we can do kind of the same. We can create a feature extractor, and we take a small part of the image. So let's just take the center part of the image. And then we create, again, a perceptron, which we just learned about. And we create one perceptron, which says, is this a line or not a line? And then we create another perceptron, which says, is this an arc or not an arc? And with deep learning, you, they, like, the features, they learn themselves. So you don't really know what they are learning. So it can be anything that might be interesting, like a hole with pixels around it. Might be an interesting feature here. So what you do is you have multiple of these perceptrons, uh, like a small neural network, and you can slide that over the image. So that looks a bit like this. You have um, an input image. Then you slide this thing over it, which extracts all these features and puts it in a new smaller image and uh, with all these features that are constructed from that. At the end, for your convolutional neural network, you take the output, these features that are like spatial, and then you can feed that through a normal feed forward network again that we just discussed. And here again, you have an activation per class. And if the activation for one class was too high, then you propagate that error through the neural network and say, hey, maybe this one feature that we detected here, the weights for it should have been a bit different. And then you get a slightly different feature. So that's like in 10 minutes the best, uh, best I could do, I think. We now learned about what a perceptron is, which we use to predict the, the price of a house. We learned about what a feed-forward network is, where features are constructed from the inputs. We learned about that if you add multiple layers, you have a deep for feed-forward network. Deep learning is always a bit unclear how many layers you need before you can call it deep learning. But just, I think three is probably enough. And then we learned about the deep convolutional neural networks, which you can use for images, where you slide your detector over the image to check local features and use these local features to predict the output. So that's it.